Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm welcoming Araz Azadian to uh, speak to us about the guidance he just put out yesterday. So that was the Q4 2021 and the 2022 guidance. So we'll be asking a number of questions that CHF has, pre has prepared. And then there'll be some questions from uh, shareholders at the end of that that Jordan will ask. So all you need to do is click on the um, button that has the queue on it to leave your questions if something comes up during our call. So first question, Araz, your revenues have grown very nicely over the last couple of years. What makes you so confident that this year you're going to have a 300% increase? Uh, great question. And, and thanks for having me, Kathy. Thanks for joining folks. Um, I, I think to, to start with that question, you know, we have to, we have to consider where the company stands. You know, we spent the first few years on R and D product development and strategizing how to bring these specific products into the marketplace, understanding the regulations of the markets that, we are involved in and today we're very happy and very proud to to see our products be available across several different platforms or, or segments within the canadian marketplace um, including medical clinical and now within sort of the wellness category of the adult use side and those revenues are much more predictable you know these are products that are repeat orders from shoppers drug mart from others there, there's more and more skus that are being listed being approved by, again, Shoppers Drug Mart, other medical portals entering now, and also um, other provinces or existing provinces that are adding products. So I think from a Canadian side, considering that this is a much more mature market, I, I believe the, the, the market demand and the revenue is much more predictable where in, in the rest of the world, while we are progressing and we are in, in several international markets, we still you know, face natural regulatory uh, logistics, um, import export risks. And that's why we've been, you know, much more conservative around our, uh, our, our projections or our guidance related to those particular markets. So the real confidence really comes from the, the early success we've had in the Canadian marketplace with, with the proprietary products that we have commercialized. Excellent answer to that last question. So I'm going to lead into it with a follow-up here. So in your most recent press release, uh, containing some Q4 2021 and 2022 guidance, you indicated very strong revenues with the Canadian medical cannabis efforts. Which other areas of revenue do you foresee as being the next big contributors to your company's success? Uh, good question, Jordan. So Canada, again, being the, the relatively more mature market that we're active in is, is, was a big catalyst in 2021. It will be a major contributor into 2022, uh, but we are still in the medical cannabis or adult use slash wellness categories, which have good margins considering that our products are differentiated the products are proprietary we're not selling you know flour in in, in a jar here uh, we're selling proprietary topical transdermal sublingual and oral products however the next realm where i think the next real big opportunity for avicana and i think the major separate separator for avicana versus the, the rest of what we call the cannabis sector is going to be the pharmaceutical drugs and the pharmaceutical preparations uh, those are going to be initially registered within the South American uh, region. Uh, we expect to have about three products registered in, in 2022 in South America. And those are going to be significant revenue drivers, specifically going into the latter part of 2022 and early 2023. But what's very attractive about that is, of course, the, the proprietary nature of a pharmaceutical drug registration, marketing authorization, and of course, margins. Uh, these products are the end result of the years of R&D we've conducted here in Canada, but it's also connecting that R&D with our vertical integration, with our own active pharmaceutical ingredients that we are manufacturing in Colombia, with manufacturing of finished drugs that we're doing in Colombia, which all around gives us an accessible product for the patients in the medical community in terms of price, but also gives us a product that is very competitively priced, but also has good margins. So, that will be, I think, the next big driver for, for the company is the commercialization of the fourth uh, division or vertical, which is our pharmaceutical drugs. That's fantastic. And speaking to your pharmaceutical drugs, I would anticipate that you might have many repeat customers in those channels. You know, assuming that being the case, patient loyalty is an integral element for the success of any great corporation. How do you ensure the success of these programs? 
Yeah, absolutely. When, when you're talking about pharmaceutical drugs or even our medical products, we're, we're really talking about uh, patients. We're not talking about consumers, right? And I think that's one of the major separator, separators of Avicanus products. Uh, I, I always overly simplify or generalize the cannabis industry. And I say a person walks into a dispensary and they buy their favorite flower, they buy their favorite vaporizer. And the next time they go in, they may try something different. Uh, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to treating a chronic indication or some sort of clinical pathology, and if we've supported the medical community by offering them a formulary or products that then helps their patients alleviate symptoms or actually help uh, manage the particular clinical pathology, they're, they, they're no longer experimenting. That that's, that's the product that they're going to continue to use. That's a product that they rely on. And of course, from a business or finance perspective, of course, that's attractive. But also from a responsibility perspective, there's a lot more on our shoulders. Like we have a responsibility to ensure those products are available to those patients, whatever market, whatever channel, whatever international, uh, you know, mark, geographic market that means. We need to ensure that the patient has access to those products, that the pharmacies are carrying those products. And uh, that, that for me is, is, a, is a huge opportunity. Of course, there's a massive industry built on that. It's called the pharmaceutical industry, and that's where we're going to be operating in at a global level. And because we are dealing with pharmaceuticals and medical products, we're not limited to our particular state or a particular country, whereas in a, a recreational company would be. So very attractive. You know, it's very promising. It's, of course, a very complex process. It's taken us years to get there. Um, and it's one that comes with a lot of responsibility, but it's one that we're ready for. We're ready to execute on. That sounds wonderful, Aras. Now, you know, I do have another question with regards to your status. Um, you know, would you mind illustrating how Africana has distinguished itself as a biopharmaceutical company and separated itself from some of the recreational companies facing the sheer market and price pressures these days? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that's been addressed in a couple of the, a couple of the answers already. But you know, I think the sure. big misconception is that anyone working within the cannabinoid space is really a recreational company and everyone is selling pre-roll joints. Uh, and I think that distinction, that separation between those type of companies and ours uh, it has become a bit of a gray area. There is, of course, specific companies that are only working on, for example, synthetic drugs that are producing a drug that's going through clinical development and while we have a pipeline of those pharmaceutical preparations, we're already registering some of those preparations. We have also generated revenue and have generated data through our medical program. So we, we do dwell within the, the medical cannabis side of the industry and, of course, the pharmaceutical side. And I think that for us is a longer path and longer route to market. You know, that's why 2021 was the first year that we started really gener generating real revenues. In 2022, we expect that to significantly grow. But I think that's the major differentiation is that we're focusing on pro proprietary products that are functional, that are designed to either pro provide a wellness, medical, or even a pharmaceutical application, and that these products are going to be long-term uh, use for the patients. These products are going to be differentiated, separated from what's in the market. And most importantly, we get to operate at, a, at an international level. You know, we are not in the cannabis industry. We are in the pain, sleep, dermatology, oncology neurology industries, which are substantially larger. And, you know, through the Convention on Narcotics of the United Nations, we're permitted to export these products, you know, and I think what we then have built in South America is a vertical integration that allows us to connect our intellectual property with our own organic and sustainable botanical cannabinoids with GMP manufacturing that allows us then to cater that at a global level. The challenge we're facing is, you know, being painted with the same brush of the general, I would say, recreational cannabis companies. You know, and it's funny you mentioned a lot of the uh, vertical integrations to date in the international markets. And Avicana has a wide array of many enticing and fascinating product lines. Now, in operating within all these diverse markets and distribution channels on an international scale, I'd like to know what some of the selection criteria established are when evaluating which products might be best received in each country or domain that you operate within? That's a great question. And I think uh, it's, it's going to be a complicated answer, but you know, a typical pharmaceutical company will spend years doing market assessment and, you know, uh, market research though. They would do a lot of the, the 
the key European Indian leader events with the physicians to understand the market potential for a drug that they would commercialize. For us, because we're pioneers in terms of the cannabinoid-based sort of functional medical and pharmaceutical products, um, because of the can cannabis regulations, we have the opportunity to commercialize some of these products much earlier stages and, in fact, generate real market acceptance, market data, rather than just making assumptions and market analysis. And that's, that's the case, as we saw in Canada. You know, we launched with Shoppers Drug Mart what is now 12 products, and we're seeing really through real world evidence studies that are that our products are enrolled in through feedback from physicians, patients, through feedback from the clinic partners, who is using our products for what, you know, and I think that data is very, very valuable because it's real. It's it's practical experience of the products within a marketplace. So we, we do test markets, you know, we in addition to the market analysis that we do, the regulatory analysis that we do, we have this in very interesting opportunity to test products, brands, within markets, typically through the medical or wellness category and see where there's the most potential. And based on that, I think that's how we prioritize where to dedicate most of our resources. Because at a global level, again, because we are vertically integrated, we own the intellectual property, we have the, we could be price competitive and we could be accessible to consumers and patients, we think at a global level. But the reality then becomes, where do you prioritize as a small company with limited resources? Do you go full throttle in all markets? And I think that's where the answer comes back to no, we prioritize based on ROI, based on which markets have the most uh, maturity. You know, Canada is a very important one. We obviously enter the Canadian market later than others because of our style of products, but we've been successful because of the, of the proprietary nature. And I think Canada will be a priority for 2021, 20, 2022 and on. But we're starting to now look at other markets that we have launched and we're learning from the outcome of those markets in terms of what products, what categories will be most successful. And you may have already addressed this, but I do think this is really relevant given the current market conditions in place. So obviously distribution, logistics, supply chain are very hot topics in the current market. There've been a lot of delays and overhauls in the way within which we believe or we interact on the public market space. Would you be able to key into some of the strengths of your logistics or supply chain infrastructure that might have enabled your success during these difficult times? Absolutely. Um, of course, we face some challenges, especially as a rapidly growing company, right? And if you look at, for example, our numbers during all of 2020, we, you know, we sold 4,000 units. It's relatively easier to predict, plan, forecast, you know, 4,000 units. During 2021, we sold 124,000 units and across a number of different SKUs. So it, it is it is a challenge. I think forecasting and operations is key. We're, we're, we're new to it all in terms of Avicana commercializing really for the first time in terms of finished products. So from our from our side, we had to plan not only packaging, but also manufacturing. And when it comes to the, our finished products, we're, they're not basic formulations where you're, you're just utilizing MCT oil as a carrier, for example. Each of these formulations has, you know, eight to, to 15 excipients. So to coordinate that, to forecast that, to ensure manufacturing is done at the right rate, at the right level, um, and to do that at, at a growing pace that we've faced was difficult. But I think the team has done a very, very good job of answering to that, to that challenge. Um, and I think so far we haven't had major, major issues in terms of the global supply chains. We haven't allowed that to, to, to really affect us. And that's because we've been forecasting and preparing in advance and buying inventory in terms of the excipients and packaging. Um, moving forward, you know, forecasting will be the key again, because you're, you're not talking, you're talking about pharmaceutical products or at least pharmaceutical grade products that have shelf life stability as a major, major variable. So you can't produce products that you continue to sell for years and years at a time. You know, each batch has right. a particular shelf life. So it's a lot of juggling. It's a lot of forecasting. It's a lot of operational meetings and, and, and demand planning. And I think, we're prepared for it. Uh, we haven't really allowed it to be a major challenge. Uh, an area that would theoretically have been a major challenge would have been, I think, the most important ingredient being the cannabinoids themselves. Uh, you know, the active ingredients being the CBD or the THC. And of, outside of Canada, uh, we're producing that ourselves. So we're controlling that side of the uh, of the supply chain and not allowing that to be in any way uh, an, an issue or a challenge for the organization. Exciting news. You've recently entered into a master supply agreement with a very established Chilean pharmaceutical company. 
What are some of your expectations from that business model or some of the relationships in South America? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, look, South America for me is a very promising market for our global operations for, for many reasons. Uh, one, because of our vertical integration in South America, we have a lot of the regulatory benefits. Uh, you know, you register a product in Colombia that makes the process much easier to register in other countries. Uh, but another reason is the accessibility. Because our, we're producing these products at a much lower cost in Colombia, you know, our flour is five cents a gram today or around that. Um, we're able to produce products at a competitively price while while they have well good margins for us in terms of our operations. These are products that the typical you know patients in South America can afford. Um, and I think that's going to be a massive opportunity because South America is from a regulatory perspective has been very progressive. You know, countries like Chile that you mentioned, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Mexico is coming along are putting in regulations that are gonna allow medicine and pharmaceutical preparations to be offered. Not recreational, but medicine. And of course, that's an area that we're, we're specializing in. So we're very excited about South America. Of course, it's gonna be a, a long haul. Again, we're not a recreational company and it's going to take time. Uh, in, case of, in the case of NOPE in Chile, they are, uh, I think, the biggest phytotherapeutic or plant you know, pharmaceutical company in, in, in the country. They're, I think, a hundred year old company. and they are using our cannabinoids today for their drugs. They've already registered one. Uh, so we look forward to seeing those volumes obviously increase, but we're also form, we have formed and are forming similar relationships in other South American markets. We've already announced Argentina and Ecuador. Uh, we're finalizing several major deals with other major markets, including Brazil, that will be either similar in terms of the active pharmaceutical ingredients or Avicana's own drug preparations. And I think those are going to start showing fruit within 2022 in terms of the potential. Um, it's expected that South America over the next five years or so will be a $5 billion market. I think today we're one of the leaders, uh, certainly leaders when it comes to pharmaceutical products and intellectual property. And I think we will earn a significant portion of that pie as it, as it matures and as the industry grows. Excellent. Thank you very much for that informed response, Aras. I've got a last question here from CHF, and then we're going to switch over to some of the investor questions that have been posed. So I would be interested to know at what revenue level the company breaks even. It's a trick question, but um, I think, you know, I think it's it's going to be a function of, of the sales mix. You know, in, in Canada, where today or in 2021, the largest portion of our revenue is from Canada. Those margins, while you know higher than sort of industry averages, are going to be within the sort of the thirty-five to fifty percent range uh, because it's a much more competitive market, and uh, we are essentially outsourcing everything from manufacturing to, to, to commercialization to the sales channels. Example: Shoppers Drug Mart, um, and that's a big portion of our revenue today. Uh, South America, where we're talking about pharmaceutical drugs, medical, and leveraging off of our vertical integration, we have much higher margins and we're more in the pharmaceutical margin range. So when the sales mix proportionally grows towards South American or global revenue that, that we're working on, um, I think we will be much closer to, 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 to a 55, 60% margin. And within that range, I think we're, we're probably in the three and a half to $4 million range Canadian per, per quarter to be uh, break even, or at least it'd be the positive. And I think we're, we're, we're getting close. I think this year is going to be a year that we're going to certainly get very close to that towards the end of the year. We, we are seeing pretty significant growth and pretty consistent growth in terms of about 30% a quarter over the last four quarters. We expect that to grow as more and more markets come online, more and more SKUs are listed, more and more commercial channels are established. So I think we're certainly on our path. To, to, to achieving that. And the company is becoming more self-sufficient every day uh, because as you go towards that path, your cash needs are less, you have more cash flowing, more operation, more operational flow, and we're getting much more comfortable operating with a lot less external uh, injections. I've got a question here from Mike Freeman, and he'd like to ask, uh, could you describe in finer detail the opportunities you're seeking to capture in the South American pharmaceutical space? Which countries or which companies and which patient populations? It's a great question, Mike. Um, so I'll start off with maybe going by country. And I think each country has a very different regulatory system. 
So Colombia, for example, there, we have an opportunity and we've already submitted for drug approval for a generic version of Epidiolex, which is you know, obviously a pharmaceutical preparation for epilepsy. We believe we're going to attain that marketing authorization in the next few months. That would be a 10% CBD drug formulation, which we, we've branded under TrueNorex. That product will then be available to, to neurologists to prescribe to their epileptic patients. And I imagine some off-label prescriptions will also take place. Additionally, in Colombia, we have the opportunity to register phytotherapeutics, which is some of the, our other role phyto preparations that have now undergone GMP pilot production, uh, stability studies under ICH, and that allows us to then register those products from a, from a technical dossier perspective. And then from a pharmacological side, as a phytotherapeutic, we're actually provided the opportunity to register these products and make particular claims of uh, using pharmacological dossiers that are built out of literature. So literature review, preclinical, and even real world evidence from the Abicana side. So that's kind of the Colombian opportunity. Uh, this is one, obviously a market that we're very active in, and I think that's gonna be a, a, a good opportunity for us. The one up market that I'm most excited about is Brazil. Uh, we've already announced uh, a pharmaceutical active ingredient relationship. We're supplying one of the companies that's registering a number of products. Uh, but the Brazilian regulations under RDC 327 allows us to register a pharmaceutical preparation that as long as a product has a full technical dossier, meaning again, GMP production, ICH stability, and we, we can register that product and then we will have five years then to do the clinical development. And during those five years, that product has marketing authorization. So that product can be then sold to patients. Of course, that's going to be done through a sales force and education. We are not looking to, to do that work ourselves. We, have, we are partnering with a number of companies in Brazil or final stages of those type of agreements. Um, and once that product is approved, which we expect our first product to be the 10% CBD again, uh, oral formulation, uh, we expect that approval to take place in the first half of 2022. Uh, we expect pretty significant revenue and growth considering the Brazilian market is you know, 220 million people or so. Um, and again, the regulations are quite, quite practical. Uh, we're seeing similar regulations in Argentina, Ecuador, Peru, where again, you're either referencing a, a particular drug that's approved somewhere else, essentially a generic or phytotherapeutics, which is you're relying on literature. But again, our current, we have about four or five products that are currently either completed in terms of a technical dossier or in draft technical dossier stage, which means we could have a full formulary of pharmaceutical preparations in several South American markets over the next 18 months. So again, very excited about the opportunity. Clinical indications predominantly are going to be focused on epilepsy, uh, anxiety, chronic pain. Those are the top sort of three. And then we're, we're in the process of actually registering some of our topical candidates that you would be familiar with, inclu including the epidermolysis bullosa cream and the osteoarthritis gel as well within that region. Excellent. I've got a last question here from Mike Freeman before we wrap things up. Um, how do you view the European cannabinoid markets heading into 2022? How might Avicana benefit from reform taking place in Germany and other EU nations? We're certainly active in that region, Mike, and uh, we've been active for some time. But it, as you know, it's a much more competitive market. There's a lot more players. Uh, the regulations in terms of EU GMP requirements are a lot more difficult. Um, we are GACP uh, in terms of our cultivation. We are organic certified, but our extraction is not yet EU GMP certified. So we're, we're limited in some ways from entering the market today. That requires a little bit more investment from our side, which we are currently uh, not prioritizing to be, to be completely frank. I think EU will be more of a second half of 2022, early 2023 venture. But with that said, we are entering the European Union uh, from a cosmetic side, from the CBD side, and that, that is covered both on Pura, our skincare line, but also our deep tissue gels, which are covering more of the analgesic effects, you know, the localized pain effects. So we are entering the market through a, a number of strategic partnerships that are in final stages as well. So we are entering, but it will be more so focused on topicals in the earlier stage. Um, as the industry evolves in the European Union, um, as the regulations evolve and as our infrastructure evolves in terms of the extraction being EU GMP, we think we're very well positioned in terms of our formulations, our products, of course, and our, and our low cost input materials, which could make our products extremely attractive. Sounds fantastic, Aras. Thank you very much. At this point, this, uh, this closes off the Q&A segment of today's webinar. 
I'd like to thank you for taking the time to meet with us today and for addressing all of these fascinating questions. Uh, should anyone have any further inquiries or questions, you're welcome to email myself or Ras, and we would be happy to uh, address those at a later point in time. But with that being said, uh, thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to many more great and exciting opportunities with Avicana in the future to come. Thanks, Mitchell. Thanks, for, thanks Jordan. Thanks for having me here. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> All right, everyone. Take care. All the best.